day you were transferred to Angola prison, what went through your mind? Um, I was honestly scared to death. And I remember looking around the bus, some of the men faces you could see terror, bewilderment. Some of the men faces, it was just a blank stare. It was the bloodiest penitentiary in the nation. You had two types of people, predators and prey. Either you became among the most violent men, or you were one of the most abused men. There's killings almost every other day. They were saying that you make sure you find you a shank and keep it on you and watch the company you keep. And since Warden Kane has come here, it's a different prison because it's different leadership. Angola is a maximum security prison with 6,300 prisoners seated on the Mississippi River with 18,000 acres, which is about the same size as Manhattan Island. And 90% of the inmates you meet are going to die here. The reputation was such that I didn't want the job. I did not apply for this job. I did not say, please let me go to Angola. I'll do you a good job. I said, I don't want this job. And so I was tactically coerced by the Secretary of Corrections, who was a dear friend, to take it temporarily. Because I came here in 95, so I've been here a little bit over 20 years. When I became a prison warden, I told my mom, she said, let me tell you one thing. She said, God, you're going to hold you accountable that they have a chance to know him. And if you fail at that, he is going to punish you. And I said, yes, ma'am. Immediately when I came here, it was a horrible place. And it was running me crazy. There was blood everywhere. They would fight with a lock in the sock. They had weapons. We couldn't get the weapons. And we couldn't get through it. The first time in my life that I really felt that God talked to me was here. But it was also the first time in my life that I was desperate enough to listen. The whole deal was, if I could make a moral, I could heal the prison. We found a morality in religion because in our culture, you find morality quicker in religion than anywhere else. And I'm desperate for morality real quick. Now, the cool thing about moral rehabilitation is everybody from every group, atheist or what have you, wants people to be moral, and they want them to rehabilitate. So those two words could find no enemies. Turn in your textbook, please, to 151. Jesus is talking with the disciples in the setting of the upper room. And Warden Kane brought the seminary, the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And they have an extension center here, a four-year college, two-year associate, four-year bachelor's degree in Christian ministry and theology. What better way for God to change a place than for men to learn about who God really is? The Bible College has also trained men not just to go serve in their church. A lot of the men that have attended the school have been strategically placed in the dormitories to help change the culture and become lights. It worked in the seminary. If you're truly rehabilitated and you change your life, you also learn it's better to give than to receive. Criminals are takers. They just take, take, take. So to break that cycle, we need to have programs so we let you show your moral and, and feel like you're the moral person, give back. So then we started the toy shop where we make about 6,000 toys, wooden toys that we give away at Christmas. We probably give away 1,500 bicycles at Christmas. We do Johnny and Friends wheelchairs. We've sent 1,700 wheelchairs to third world countries. We work in the field and harvest all the vegetables by hand. Everybody has a job here. There's no unemployment, and that's a good thing. The work is meaningful work. It's not just make work. But the point is, the culture changed in the prison totally to where the mom and daughter can walk anywhere in the prison. No whistles, no cat calls, no graffiti. There's no gangs in the prison. And the stats are incredible when it comes to violence. And so, truly, God did 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. He healed this land. Amazing, amazing grace, how, how 
How sweet. It's almost like a revolution. It's a God-driven revolution where the, God drives our culture and God drives what we do and we get our spiritual guidance from Him and we listen to Him and look, it's amazing. He really does tell us what to do. I can't believe it. Oh, ranch, like me. Warden Kane has opened up the doors in this prison for programs to take place, for ministries to come in, for churches to function, for things to happen that wouldn't normally happen in any other institution. He's a different type of leader because of the God factor. I don't know his walk, I don't know his everyday life, but I know that he has a relationship with God because it shows in the everyday events in this prison. And if it had not been for that relationship, many of us wouldn't have a relationship with God either. I don't have any love for any man as great as I do for Warden Kane, nor any more respect. And for a convict to say that he loves a warden is not gonna win me very many fans, but it's just fine. He has brought so much opportunity in this prison, and he gave me the benefit of the doubt when no one else would. You gotta do that little devotional every morning, because if you do that little devotion every morning, you're just putting the gas in the car and you're keeping it going because it gets you where that you can hear God. It's not that he just all of a sudden says, do this or do that so much. He makes you think it. And then you realize, I couldn't have thought of that because it'll be such an awesome thought. And that thought you're having because you're close to him and you're praying, and you're praying for guidance and leadership, that you're gonna think of it. The legacy that I leave here is not bricks and mortar. The legacy we leave here is what's in the hearts of these men.